So let me introduce Dr. Tuerti. He's a, a truly a world-recognized scientist. In my thinking, when it comes to science, he's got street cred. <laughs> he's a synthetic organic chemist, which means he puts molecules together. He builds molecules. And he specializes in nanotechnology. He's a, get this, he's a triple professor at Rice. Now, I've spent my whole career trying to become a professor in one discipline. <coughs> this guy's a, 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 a professor in three separate disciplines, chemistry, material science, and, na and nano en engineering, as well as in computer science. Typically, faculty are judged on the amount of output of their research, and one or two a year is what's expected of you. Dr. Tura has 700 research publications, and when you spread that out over, uh, you know, if you were, I, I don't know exactly how long you've been teaching, Jim, but if you spread that out over 20, that's 35 papers per year, and so uh, a phenomenal output. We measure research success by the number of times people refer to our ideas, and Dr. Tour's papers have received, his publications have received about 100,000 citations. He has over 130 patent families, and there are currently 12 companies that are operating today that he founded. He was inducted into the National Academy of Inventors in 2015. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. When you say things like that, those of us in the scientific community realize, wow, that's, uh, that's really special. He's been named among the 50 most influential scientists in the world today. He's named Scientist of the Year by Research and Development Magazine, ranked one of the top 10 chemists in the world over the past decade by Thomas Reuters. And he's twice won the Rice uh, Teaching Award, the Teaching Award at uh, the University Teaching Award at Rice, which is no small school, no mean school. <coughs> Dr. Drew is anything but one dimensional. He is also a fervent and warm hearted follower of Christ, and you're going to get a taste of that here in just a second. He is a scientist who fully embraces his faith in Christ. When I think about the people who can speak to this question of whether or not science and faith can go together, I don't think there's a person on the planet who will do a better job of that and has more authority to speak to that issue than the guy that's going to stand up here for the next uh, 50 minutes here in front of you. So could we all give a warm welcome to the <laughs> something you do, then just wait. That's a good lecture in a moment. Let's pray. Abba, Father, I pray for the outpouring of grace in this place, and that you touch each heart here. You know each person individually, and you love them. And I pray, Father, that you speak to their hearts directly a message from you for the glory of Jesus Christ and in his name. Amen. 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 <coughs> this is my family and uh, um, you can tell which one is genetically not connected with us. <laughs> this is up every picture of the family. <laughs> this is my son-in-law and my daughter Ambreen. Ambreen is lives in Israel. She's a mediator between Palestinians and Israelis. I told her she'll never be out of work. And these are her two children, our two grandchildren. This is my next child, Sabrina. She's she's a uh, attorney in Houston, um, uh, corporate litigation. And then Josiah, he's a physician. And then Ben, he uh, just finished up a term, two-year term with. Uh, J.P. Morgan is in investment banking. Now he's in private equity in Chicago with a big firm, and he makes more than all the rest of his siblings combined. <laughs> this is my wife, Shireen. We've been married for, for 37 years, and I love her so much. You know, when I, when, I was, uh, when I was young, I used to see 
see these guys with women that were just so much better looking than 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 uh, than the guy deserved. I thought, I thought that, that guy must be really rich. And so people think I'm really rich. <laughs> She's flat out beautiful. And, uh, I married the prettiest lady at church, and uh, she stayed that way. All right, so here's some of the areas that we work in. And uh, we work in this area of laser do graphene. So this is spawning five companies right now. Just this, this one invention. It's just amazing. We, we take just a, a, a CO2 laser, which is found in every machine shop, and we write it over any surface, and it converts it into graphene. This is not dropping graphene. Graphene is one atomic thick sheets of graphite. Uh, it's this new space-age material that's stronger than anything else of these dimensions. And this is turning the carbohydrate strands of the bread into graphene. You're not dropping it in, you're converting the structure. This is on polyimide, this is on the coconut, this is a super capacitor made out of coconut. It's graphene nanoribbons. We, we, take, we take carbon nanotubes and we unzip them chemically and they form these ribbons. And I'm going to show you in a minute what we can do with these ribbons. This is graphene, this is a, a, a memory, silicon oxide memories. This was a, 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 this is a, a, even a public company right now, it makes two terminal memory. This is uh, something that's going to launch this year. This is uh, uh, carbon nanoparticles for a treatment of tra traumatic brain injury and stroke. Traumatic brain injury is the number one disabler of young adults. So it's skateboards and bicycles and things like that. And uh, stroke is the number one disabler of older adults, uh, which is going to be overtaken by, with, by uh, dementia very soon. And so it treats all of those. It's just an amazing treatment. We make 3D printing of graphene, all graphene 3D printing. This is uh, uh, carbon nanotubes that are grown seamlessly from graphene. This is a, a, for the anodes of new batteries, which also had to develop a catalyst because these anodes have 10 times the capacity of a normal anode. So we had to also build a new cathode to run with this. And so that's a battery company now just, just south of Houston. Um, these are graphene quantum dots. Graphene quantum dots we made from coal. Uh, graphene quantum dots, when we started our work, they were, were uh, a million dollars per kilogram. Yeah, kilogram, a million dollars. And we learned how to make this from coal, which is $100 per ton, in one step and 25% yield. Wow. Yes, those are interesting economics. And this is, this is, now, this is also now a public company. Um, and and uh, we, we know how to take plastic waste now and turn it into an absorbent for carbon dioxide. This is a, a new big company for us that's really taken off. This is flash graphene, where we take any carbon material in bulk by the ton scale and turn it into graphene. It's just, just going to um, be in all sorts of building materials. We make these nano cars. These are little cars that, that have four wheels and these, these motors. You shine a light and this motor begins to spin. But it actually spins much faster than that. It spins at 3 million rotations per second. And you can park 50,000 of these cars across the diameter of the human hair. And you, you can watch these driving across surfaces. And then we took the same motor. We put a peptide, <coughs> peptide linkage on here. Now we'll recognize a particular cell surface, drill holes into the cell, and kill the cell. We kill a cancer cell. Here's a bacterium. This is a super bacteria. This is one of these bacteria that kills a lot of people every year. Uh, 10 million people a year are going to die from super bacteria by the year 2050 if we don't learn how to, to overcome these things. And so these drill holes right in. <clears throat> so that's kind of an overview of the areas. Here is a, this is a rat. We, this rat has had its spinal cord cut in two, completely in two. This is a surgery that was done in South Korea. We gave them our materials and they put one drop in that spinal cord gap, and you stretch it out, do that, and then the nano ribbons, it's 1% solution of graphene nano ribbons and polyethylene glycol, and after two weeks, the rat gets up and starts walking again. This is with a completely severed into spinal cord. And, uh, um, and then, then uh, uh, this rat scored an 18 out of 21 on a mobility scale. 21 is optimal mobility. You'll see what this rat looks like now after three weeks. But what we're trying to do is make the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. But this is after three weeks. You see what this rat can do. It's and uh, scored an eight. Now it's scoring a 19 out of 21 after three weeks. And uh, uh, so the brain remaps all the connections through the graphene nanoribbons. 
So this is a new core, a new company, and it's working on, on uh, uh, optic nerve repair for doing whole eye transplants. And uh, something that's never been done before. And, and uh, peripheral nerve repair and spinal cord repair. So that kind of gives you an overview. You've seen my family, you've seen a little bit of an overview of the work that we do. So what I want to do is I want to alert students to how you can propel your career. How might you propel your career? And I give this lecture every year in, in several of my classes. And this is on, on, on how, to, how to propel one's career. And this is like, hands down, the things the students tell me was the most valuable thing to them, how to propel their career. And so one of the things you want to do is you want to try non-traditional things. So once you graduate, you don't want to keep doing the same thing. You try something non-traditional. In the corporate world, be prepared to travel, do whatever you're called to do to learn that company. I have CEOs come into my house and talk to groups of students over Sunday lunch. And I want them to hear. And I say, tell me, what, how did you go from being an engineer to running Conical Phillips? I mean, how did that happen? And, and, uh, uh, and generally, they, they, they learn all about that company. If you're in academia, you try something far out your, outside your comfort zone. You don't want to keep doing the same thing. And so this, this little molecule, this is a molecular switch, and this is something that I built early on in my career. This was later, this was a paper that I later wrote about, about uh, sum, summarizing all the work. But we had built this actually in, in uh, 1989 is when we had first published on these molecules. And these acted like molecular switches. And I'm just reading an article in, in a journal, the Journal of the American Chemical Society, about a molecular switch that came out of IBM. And I, and I, I contacted the guy at IBM, and this was in 19, 1988. And so how do you contact somebody at IBM when there is no internet yet to contact them? We use something called a telephone. And uh, you would call directory for that city, and you would ask for the number of IBM, and then you'd call up IBM, and you actually got a human being. And you'd ask for the person, and they'd connect you to that person. And I, and I called him, I said, does anybody ever made this molecular switch you published? He said, no, it's all theoretical. So I said, I think we can make that. And we made it, and it got all of this press. And, and Scientific American called and they said, we heard you've made the most complex molecule ever synthesized, which was an absolute joke. But I didn't want to tell them that. I said, well, it's really complex. And, and, uh, uh, and so I learned that if we take our skills of organic chemistry and move it into areas that haven't seen it before, meaning electronics, then we could get this huge amount of publicity. You move into areas, you take the skills that you have and you move into areas that, that uh, traditionally haven't, haven't had your area of research in it. Learn to write letters with a pen. I don't know if you've ever done that before. But, so what you do is you write letters by hand, you send them by email, you send thank you notes to colleagues and acquaintances and business, you keep a record of it. Every Saturday morning I go into my office and the first thing I do is I sit down for about 20 minutes and I just write five or six cards of thank yous to people, the people that I've met, and, and uh, just building context. If I read an article in the literature and I say, wow, this is an amazing article, I wish I had thought of that. I would write a letter to that person and say, I was reading your article, it was an amazing article, I really commend you on this. Just a few lines, it already has my name and, 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 and university address, and put it in an envelope and drop it in the mail. What does this do? Well, after decades of doing this, there's a whole lot of people that really like me. <laughs> <laughs> and they put their names down as reviewers on my papers and proposals. I praise their work. And uh, uh, they usually reciprocate. And so this really goes a long it's way. It's I will travel overseas and people say, that. and they'll show me on their bulletin board, is my letter that I sent them years ago. It meant so much to them. Learn how to write letters. I tell all my students, when you go out on a job interview, you get the card of everybody you've spoken, and you write them a thank you note. Email, no. Everybody gets lots of emails. You write them a thank you note, and they will go, wow, this person has class. And immediately, it elevates you above your peers. <coughs> you learn how to make friends. So you work hard to build relationships with influential people in your profession. This is what you got to do. You say, well, you isn't this kind of slimy? It's not slimy at all. This is the way the world works. You learn how to build a network of people. And these are not Facebook friends that are electronic. You haven't done anything. These are build relationships with people. 
goes a long way. So, for example, poster sessions, whenever an assistant professor, um, uh, you, so, so new assistant professors don't get to give the talks, but they do posters like graduate students. And I would watch, and I'd, and I'd, and I'd see some famous person going by, and I'd, and I'd go out and grab him by the arm. Professor Pritchett, come here. And I go to show you my poster. And I go with all the animation that I had, describing to him my poster. And I knew I had him when he stopped looking at what I was describing and he looked down at my name tag at these meetings. Mm -hmm. he, you know, I had his attention. He knew who I was at this point. Mm -hmm. I would invite famous people for talks to the university. I would invite people to come and give lectures at the university. And, uh, and, th and, then, and then I would, I, I would uh, make friends with them. So in my first year as an assistant professor, I invited three people. They were, they were leaders in the field, and I invited them. I said, hey, my assistant professor would love to have you come down and get a talk and work at Three people came. All three of those gentlemen that came to visit me that year eventually ended up winning the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Wow. Now, I would like to think it's because I invited them. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened. But it shows you. And so now what I would do is that when you go up for promotions, you need to put the names of people that can evaluate you. I put these guys down. <laughs> their names down. I had invited them to, and, and, and uh, so I'd invite them in for talks. I'd invite key administrators for dinner to the home. First, I'd invite those famous people into my home for dinner. I'd invite key administrators, assistant professor. I invited the president of the university, and the secretary said, "Well, he's very busy." I said, "I know, I know, I know." Next semester, not this semester, next semester, and if not that semester, the semester after, please, I want him to my home. So the president came over to my home with his wife. He says, I've never been to a home like this. He says, I get invited to big Christmas parties. Get, just, it's just us. I said, yeah, it's just us. It's my wife, and at the time I just had the two little girls, and this is my little girl. My colleagues found out that I was inviting the president over to my home. One colleague said, uh, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? So why don't, why don't you first start with the chair of the department, and then go to the, the dean, and then go to the, where are you at? The president? Another colleague said, why don't you, why don't you, uh, uh, Dress your kids in rags and say, this is the best I can do on what you pay us. <laughs> anyway, he came over and he had a great time. He and his wife, my kids were, my kids were collecting Starburst candy wrappers. And they weren't allowed to eat that much, so they kept giving it to him. And he kept eating them and they kept collecting them. <laughs> From that day, he was my friend. Any meeting like this, you know, the faculty, they, they go, hey, Jim, he give me a thumbs up. And we were buddies after that. I just made friends right at the top. And people go, how do you know your president? He's been in my home. <laughs> when I invited program managers, the people who fund you in the, in, in the NSF, the Department of Defense, I'd invite them over my home for dinner. They think we're going out to Renault, into my home. Every restaurant, it blends together after you travel a lot. You don't remember restaurants. I wanted them to come in my home. I wanted them to see my wife. I wanted them to see my children. So that when the next funding round came up, they remembered my children. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you build relationships this way. This propels a career. And, and I have found, what I have seen with this electronics generation, that young people have never learned what it is to establish and build relationships with people. This is how it used to be done, and it still works. Most of the people that run companies are like my age, and we respect getting a handwritten letter. You stand out. <clears throat> my program managers, corporate leaders to my home. I befriend and show kindness to secretaries, custodians, maintenance person workers. A secretary can ruin your day. <laughs> Believe me, they really can. I've seen it. So you, want to, you just want to be, you can be civil, be nice, custodian. My custodian's name is Maria. I said, Maria, tell me. And tell me about your family. And she has, has these two boys. I said, well, tell me about your boys. And she'd tell me about her boys and struggles they're having. I said, are they going to college? Well, they don't make, they've got to come in and see me. Bring them in here. i got to meet with your boys. And I met with her boys. And, and, uh, and then they came over to my house. And, and hmm. Maria would do anything for me. Anything. I just, anything's wrong in my office. The light's out. That's not her job. I said, Maria, my light's out. Don't worry. I'll take care. <laughs> and sure enough, there's some electrician coming in and putting in light. Well, my 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 colleagues say, how come everybody's always tending to your office? I say, they don't be. <laughs> it's my custodian. There was, a, there, was a, there was a guy who was under the sink, and he was fixing the sink. And I looked under there and said, hey, how you doing down there? He says, hey, how you doing? 
And, uh, and so we struck up a conversation. He says, you do a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I said, that's a great attitude. I like that attitude. He's my buddy. If I got a plumbing problem, I just call my buddy. If I'm going to put in a work order, my buddy just comes with his wrench and it's done. You befriend people, they really streamline your career. Learn how to make friends. I'm telling you, as students, you can walk around, you see a maintenance worker, they really look up to you like, wow, you're a student in this place? And, and they're, they're trimming hedges? If you just stop and you speak to them for one minute, that will really touch their life. They'll go home, they'll tell their spouse about that. They'll, that means something to them. So even as a student, when you address them, it means something to them. You do that, it'll, it'll help your career. One, I learned to work, walk in honesty and proper speech. I have the admonition to change my words and my actions. So in Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4, it says, Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. You don't let kindness and truth leave you. You work in truth. You be honest, 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 all about your work. <clears throat> so the words that I use, I, I, I learned that you have to be careful about the words that I use. I can be really intense and just, you, you know, and, and I'm calm now compared to the way I used to be. I, you know, younger, I was, I was tight as a band in the street. It was just, I was ready to burst. And, and, uh, and I would go into these meetings and God would remind me, don't let kindness and truth leave you. And say, Lord, bind it around my neck. Bind it around my neck. And, and uh, one day I was speaking with a patent lawyer in, in New York City, and I had never met her, and there was no internet. This was in, in like 1989. There was no internet where you could just look up what people looked like or anything. I had no idea what she looked like. And I was talking, and, uh, and, and I said, we, we need to do this on the patent. She said, yeah. I, I, I'm good at that. And I said, yeah, I, I bet you're good at everything you do. Well, that probably wasn't the right thing to say. There was silence on the other end. And I, I learned I had to be particularly careful what I say to women in the way that it could be misconstrued. My actions and my words toward women could be misconstrued. I had to be really careful. The things that I do, so for example, in software, when I started working in, uh, as, as, a, as an assistant professor, I got a great computer. It was a, it was a, a Mac SE. It had one megabyte of RAM. It was an amazing computer. And, and, uh, and so, so uh, uh, I got this computer and I got the software for it. And then I, the next year, computers would change dramatically every year back then. And then the next year, I got a Mac SE 30 for the lab. Computer from my lab, and that had 30 megabytes of RAM. And and uh, then I bought a whole other set of software because I called up Microsoft. I actually called Microsoft, and they said, "No, one computer, one set of software." Back then, it was one and one, and the computers didn't talk to each other, so you could have easily violate it. But no, I bought another set of software. I bought another ChemDraw, and then another Word package. And then the next year, I got another computer for the lab, and I bought another set of software. And one of my colleagues he said, "What are you doing?" I said, well, I'm buying software. I called the companies. They said I had to, you're crazy. Just load it on there. I said, no, you're not allowed to do that. You know what would happen? At the end of the funding year, I would get calls from program managers in Washington. They'd say, hey, Jim, we got some extra money. Can you use it? I mean, God would bless me enormously. I, I thank God for these strong software policies. I got rich off of this in my friends <laughs> by honoring these software policies. And I, I never wanted this. Music on my devices, software on my devices that I didn't own. And I would send my students, if there's software in our lab devices that we don't own, take it off. I'll buy the software. The more software I buy, the more money is sent to me. If I walk uprightly, I will be greatly blessed. If you cheat on these things, it's going to affect your career. Because God sees everything. You may think, well, this is just a little cheat. But you know it. You're violated. You walk uprightly and you will be blessed. You condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same thing, Romans 2 1 says. The value of family, the admonition to value my family. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So I had daily times with my family. I'd wake up my kids at 5.30 in the morning. Yeah, 5.30 in the morning. And, and uh, we'd have family devotions together. We'd go through the whole story of the Bible. We'd pray together, memorize scripture together. And then we, 
we pray for each other. All my kids learn how to pray. They all had to pray. And uh, we'd lay hands on each other, and then I'd lay hands on them, and I'd pray, and, and I was out of the house by 6. I left at 6, and I was home for dinner by 6. We had dinner together at 6. Now, I know I had a wife who took care of the kids after I woke them up and, and did the family devotions. My wife was there, and she took it from me. And not everybody has that luxury. And I meet a lot of women who are professors, and, and I know it's a lot of work, and, and, and uh, they, they're, they're watching these kids, and I recommend that they ought to do what I do, just get a wife. I mean, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, not everybody can schedule it this way. I realize that. But you've got to have time with your family. Time in the Scriptures. Time in the Word of God. Time with your family. If you're not a believer, learn to have time with your family. I was always home in time for dinner. And I remember some of my colleagues saying, you're an assistant professor. We never see you working nights. Nice. I'd say, gentlemen, I'm sorry. I leave my house at 6 in the morning. i got to be home for dinner at 6. And there's nothing left of me in the evenings. Because I've already been gone 12 hours. And, uh, but I scheduled my time like that. And, we had, and, then, and then while my wife was cleaning up after dinner, I would put the kids to bed, starting with the youngest, just working my way on up. And uh, I had a disciplined <coughs> schedule of work time and family time. And my colleagues would often ask me, how do you do that? How is that done? And this is Rick Smalley, who won the 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He was the one who recruited me to move to Rice University, which I, I moved there in 1999. And, and uh, Rick, who was a Nobel Prize winner, had, uh, I think he, he, he had three or four wives, and he had you know, broken, broken relationships. And he used to ask me, he said, Jim, how do you do this? How do you have these kids that love you so much and this wife that's such a kind woman and you love her and she loves you all these years? How do you do it? You know, you want to know what really strikes people? It's when they see this sort of thing, when they see the godly things that sometimes we take for granted. This really strikes them. Rick Smalley uh, received the Lord a few years before his death of, from leukemia. He was in remission and, and, uh, and just sharing with him. He saw this, of what God can do in a life, and this impressed him. He came to the Lord. This affects people. <clears throat> Hard work coupled with a balanced family life. I urge you, do not trash your family for your career. You work hard at your family. You've got to go in this with a purpose that we are in this for the long haul. I guarantee you, you will have trouble in your marriage. But... You are there, and this is to last. And you make it work. You get the help to make it work, and you do what it takes. <laughs> I wrote this article in 2007 in the Journal of Organic <coughs> Chemistry. I submitted 37 proposals in my first 36 months as a faculty member. And most of those as a single principal investigator, since collaborative proposals were less common in those days. In 2007, I was asked to summarize my career. So can you imagine that? In 2007, they wanted me to summarize my career. I don't know. So they must have thought I was done. But, um, <laughs> but I wrote, because it's true, 37 proposals in 36 months. I worked very hard. I knew what hard, I know what hard work is. And, and computers weren't like they are now. So I would, I would type, and, and I was so happy I, I had a word processor. I didn't have to use the typewriter for this. And I leave spaces. <laughs> and then, then I'd print that out. And then I'd go into ChemDraw, draw these structures. And then I cut them out and I paste them and cut and paste had a wow. real meaning. <laughs> that's, what you to do. that's what you had to do on your proposals. And then you take down all the edges so that you could photocopy it without leaving the, 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 the border there. It would show up. And then you photocopies, make copies of that, and you run off about 14 copies, and then you check every page to make sure they were all there. And then you put them in a package and you mail that to the National Science Foundation. Wow. Yeah, that's what you have to do. No, no, no last minute at 4.59 hit upload. No. <laughs> it wasn't there. You have to plan on these things. And, and uh, then you had to fill out all these, these, these forms that you have to fill out. And there you, you know, you, you, they, you got a book to do this and you tear out the page and you use a typewriter and you type on the forms. One of the forms was, do you maintain a drug-free work environment? And I'm thinking, who would ever say no? I mean, who would ever say no? No, I don't. No, no, we, we take drugs around here. Don't give me the drugs. And, 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 and I guess that's the test, right? Um, anyway, the forms never made sense to me, but I had to fill all those out as well. And then, and then uh, um, 
I've had lots of papers rejected. Yeah, I've had a lot of papers accepted, but it's hard work getting a paper accepted. And so I've had lots of papers rejected. I've had lots of proposals rejected. And so here's one of the things that I wrote in that paper. On the days of receiving a declination of funding letters from the NIH, sadness certainly followed. I would always call my wife Shireen because she was repeatedly there to reassure me of my self-worth. And my children were still there to call me daddy. Hence, I endeavored to dwell only momentarily on the harsh, sometimes even unnecessarily personal, comments of the reviewers. My family saw me through this thing. My wife was always there. And on the down days when I came home all beat up after reading that this proposal that I had worked so hard on was not funded, and, the, and the, the reviewers just trashed it and trashed me and said, <clears throat> you know, I remember them writing, this is like the proposal that we would expect from a graduate student who's never worked in this area. That's a little bit harsh for the assistant professor. And, and uh, she would always say, I know you're going to be able to do it. You are going to succeed. I know you can. And I'd look at her and I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she was there. And my kids would just come jumping on me. Nothing affected them. Life's okay. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to recover from this. I urge you, do not trash your family for your career. You work at this thing because they will be the best support to you throughout your career. The best support. Is there a prescription for thriving? Is there some way that you can not just maintain? I mean, really thrive. Well, the scripture says this in Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. You're going to say, well, he's preaching prosperity. I just read the scriptures, all right? Take that up with God if you've got a problem with it. I just read it. It says the man is going to be blessed if he does what? If his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. You meditate on the word of God day and night. The scriptures put it two ways. Every day and day and night. It talks very little about reading and mostly about meditating, which is slow, pensive, deliberate. You open up the word of God. You say, Lord, speak to me through this passage. Speak to me. And I start in Genesis chapter 1. I read through to Revelation 22. When I'm done, I start again. I've been doing that for over 40 years. And I say, Lord, speak to me. And I leave. I start reading where I left off the day before, and the Lord speaks to me. And he says, if you do this, you are going to be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. When everybody else is drying up, you won't. How do I know? Because God said it. He said it. He says, he will be like a tree. See that little word there, will. W-I-L-L. -L. He will. Once God says he will, it has to happen. It can't not happen. It has to happen. The world will make it happen because God has said it will happen. That's what it says. If you make the word of God your meditation, everybody else can be drying up around you. And you'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. This book of the law, Joshua 1 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Again, this is what it says. You meditate on this book day and night, and what it will do, it will cause you to be careful to do according to all that's written in it. You cannot follow the scriptures and obey it without meditating on it. It's when we behold the page and we see God has said something, we say, I need to change my mind. It puts us in conformity to God's will. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have success. Psalm 119, verse 97. I've meditated more on this verse than any other verse in the Bible. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I have had the great blessing to learn from many great teachers. And this says you're going to have more insight than all your teachers. And it doesn't say than all your Bible teachers. It says than all your teachers. 
If you make this word of God your meditation, if you make the word of God your meditation, you will excel all your teachers. How do I know? Because God said it. I have nothing to do with this. God said it. He makes it happen. There's excitement about being a scientist with faith. <clears throat> September 3rd, 1993, I'd just gotten tenure. So, so, and, and it, it's interesting. I mean, just the way God propelled my career. And, and uh, I applied for tenure after three years, and I got it. After four years, I applied for promotion to, to full professor, from associate professor, and I got it. And the next year, I got a chair. A chair doesn't mean a chair to sit on. I already had one of those. It means that somebody supplements your salary. Yeah, some rich donor gives some money to the university, and that, that money goes to the university, and the interest on that supplements your salary. And uh, I had been invited back to Purdue to give a lecture. And that Purdue is where I got my PhD. And, and I was staying right there in the Purdue Memorial Union Hotel. And it, it's a really nice hotel. It's all modern behind that, that, that older facade. But, but they have a, a school of restaurant and hotel management. And it, it's a great place, and I was staying in there. And I always pray before a lecture. But God filled me and used me. And not just before a Jesus lecture, before any lecture. And as I was reading the scriptures that morning, the Lord began to speak to me. Matthew 21, 21 says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. I said, Lord... I pray that this is the best lecture ever in that chemistry department. Because you just raising my faith. When you read the scriptures, it raises your faith. And you know, I don't, I don't, I've never even seen a fig tree. I don't like fig trees. I'm a chemist. So he's gonna do something with me around chemistry instead of fig trees. I don't work with fig trees. <laughs> and other Purdue, there's no sea. There's no there's no oceans there. There's a, it's the best lecture ever in that department. And, and uh, Peter said, Lord, how am I going to know it's the best lecture? That department's over 100 years old. How am I going to know it's the best lecture? So he said, okay, Lord, if it's the best lecture, I pray that my professor, from whom I got my PhD, would say that it was a super seminar. Because here's my professor, H. Nagishi. This was in 1993. 2010, he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But this was before, in 1993, he was just a graduate student. And, and um, when I was a graduate student, no matter what good result I would bring to him, he would say, pretty good. For your level. <laughs> <laughs> and then got all over the man's waist. And, and, uh, and so I said, Lord, none of this for your level stuff. I pray that when I get done with my seminar, that he would say that it was a super seminar. Well, I gave, I gave the seminar, and I knew God blessed, and I knew God really Lord, because I prayed that the Holy Spirit would hit the people in that room. It's so much fun to pray that the Holy Spirit hits people when they don't know the Lord, because they don't know what hit them. <laughs> and I gave that seminar, and that man was sitting right on the end row, right on the end, right? And he stood up. As soon as I got done, and stood up, he went, Super! Super! It's <laughs> like a machine! No way. Lord, you did it. You did best. And then sitting right behind him was H.C. Brown, who was already a big guy. It's 1979 Nobel Prize for the hydroboration reaction. You may remember the hydroboration reaction. I think it took with Danny Kemp. Remember the hydroboration reaction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. One person. So he, he invented that. And, and he was sitting right behind me. So he was in his 80s at the time. So I, I, I came down on the thing, platform like this. I came down and I shook his hand. And I said, thank you for coming to the seminar today. And he held on to my hand. He says, I want you to know something. That was the best seminar I've ever seen in my life. I said, that's, that's very kind of you to say so. And in typical Nobel Prize winning fashion, he said, I'm not saying it to be kind, I really mean it. <laughs> you see how God can just, there's so much excitement being a believer. 
in Jesus Christ, mm. knowing God and being a scientist. Mm. I mean, non science non non believers in Jesus never have this. They can never get this type of thing. You walk with God. There's so much, so much fun walking with God. <laughs> Application of the scriptures in my career. One day I was upset with a colleague. He he was telling undergrads about me. You know, so what happened was. Is that, is that I got hired, and a year later he got hired for a slot. We weren't competing for the same tenured position. We each had our own slot. And then one day he walks in my office. He came from Caltech, and he was really something. And he walked in my office. I remember he put his elbow on my filing cabinet, and he looked down at me as I'm working at my desk. He says, I'll get tenure before you ever do. And you might not understand the academic system, but that's not a very nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and remember, because I was there a year before him, and, and uh, uh, that's like walking up to somebody and saying, I'm better looking than you. Even if it were true, it's an ugly thing to say. And so, so uh, uh, but my career just rocketed, just took off like a rocket. And I went from having a little metal student desk with a concrete floor to having an outer desk with a secretary in an inner room, carpeting and a big wooden desk and everything. Just a few years, and it just took off. And this colleague, he still had his metal desk. <laughs> concrete floor for a long time. And uh, and then the student once came to me, she said, that old brother professor's always saying bad stuff about me. He said, I'm so upset. And I walked across the hall and I knocked on his door and was just going to give it to him and he wasn't in. And as I stood outside his office, God reminded me of a scripture that I was memorizing with my kids. We were memorizing all of Luke chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28, it says, but I say to you who fear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. And God reminded me, I needed to pray for this man. And I said, okay, Lord, I will do it. And I would go right there to Rutledge Chapel, and I would get on my knees and pray for him every day. Because I, I break at noontime every day, even to this day. I started as an undergrad, and I still do it to this day. And I pray for my work at noontime. And I went to that chapel, and I go right up there. And I'd get on my knees right there, and I would pray, and I, I'd put him in my prayers as well. And I always had this chapel all to myself, because it's only used for weddings and funerals. And other than that, it was mine. And, and, uh, and I would pray there. And you know what happened? His career really started taking off. It just so he got a big NIH grant, and things started taking off, and he got a big wooden desk, and he got a carpeted floor. And, and it got so good that after a few years, he got an offer from another university. And he accepted that offer, and he left, and I was so happy. <laughs> God dealt with my heart. And so then he could relieve me of this problem. Once, once I was dealt with, and he showed me that when I got this junk in my heart, he's allowing this stuff to deal with the junk in my heart. Mm. When I learn to conform to his word, mm. he'll deal with the problems. Mm. Uh, practical application to the scriptures, to <laughs> students in the home. So my, my wife, we, we got married my second year of graduate school. And, and we would always have these students in the home. And we still, to this day, we have students in the home every week. But we'd have these meetings in our home. And uh, my wife, they'd come in and we'd always serve a meal. And then we'd have a Bible study together. And uh, I remember these students, they, they, they were just slobs. Students don't mean to be slobs. They're just inherent. It's just good. And they'd come in our home. They'd, they'd put their feet up on the coffee table thinking it's the dormitory. And, and uh, I remember... Seeing, seeing people eating off these paper plates, and they'd be eating, and food's rolling off their plate, and they don't even know it. And, and uh, uh, one day I found my daughter, a few years in, into our marriage, and I had found my daughter who was like a year old, and she was sitting on the couch, and she was chewing on an old chicken bone, and she got between the pillows. And, and this bothered me. I said, Lord, the house is getting trashed by these students. And, and I started praying about this every day. Every day I started praying, and the Lord gave me a verse from Scripture. I was just reading through the Scriptures, and this is what I came upon. Where no oxen are in manger is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the eyes. And what happens is, your eyes keep going back to a Scripture when God's speaking to you through it. Eyes keep going back, and you say, Lord, what are you trying to say? And the Lord was saying to me, if you want to keep your little carton clean, don't have the students in. But if you want to see the work of God in their lives... If you want to see increase, don't worry about your partner. I'll take care of it. It's going to get messy. When no oxen are in danger, clean. Where they are, it's going to be messy. But you're going to see much increase. To this day, 
I would say, on average, we have 60 to 70 students in our home every week. Eating every week. My wife is a saint. An <laughs> absolute saint. My secretary tells me all the time, your wife must be a saint. <laughs> she reminds me, my wife is amazing, just amazing lady. And, uh, but once, <coughs> once I read this verse, I came and I told Shirley and I said, you know, we're never going to close this home to the work of God. We're never going to do it. And we have been so blessed. The scripture speaks specifically into our lives. And now I want to get back to, to, to you know, things that can really propel your career. This is a bunch of things, and I want you to learn to think revolutionary, not evolutionary. So in, in, on 9th of October, 1903, the New York Times had an article, and it said, quote, the flying machine, which, really, which will really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and medicians in from 1 million to 10 million years. <laughs> this is the New York Times, the great authority of the New York Times, it's going to tell us in 1903 how long it's going to take to build a flying machine. <clears throat> Same day, <laughs> the formal right, 9th October 1903, we started assembling it today. <laughs> It's so easy for people to say why something can't work or why your idea must be a failure. It can't work. It just can't work. And the movers and shakers, unless there's something contra thermodynamics, unless you're trying to violate the law of thermodynamics, I mean, give this thing a try. At least try it. You, you might succeed. You might succeed in this thing. And, and it's so easy to be a naysayer. Students, Pose these things and professors sit back and critique it. Well, that won't work because of this. But give the student a break. How do you know for sure? Maybe it'll work. And it's so easy to give reasons why something won't work. Get there and try it. I encourage you to start companies and do these things and give it a try. Yeah, some companies fail, but you learn by these failures and your next one might work. Creativity. The Bible tells us where creativity can come from. It says, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Ori, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding in knowledge and in all craftsmanship. God is the one who can fill you. He can fill you. And this man Bezalel was commissioned by Moses to build a tabernacle. It says later on in that chapter, he could work in gold, silver, and bronze, not just one metal, all three. He could work in stone cutting and stone setting. He could work in Woodwork. He could work in in fabric, perfuming, and in, in, in perfuming. The guy was amazing. If you would learn to pray and to say, Lord, make me creative like Bezalel. Make me creative like Bezalel. I pray this almost every day. Lord, make me like Bezalel. Make my students like Bezalel. It says in James, the Epistle to James, Epistle of James. You do not receive because you do not ask. The main reason you do not receive answers to prayer is because you never asked. You never really prayed. Hmm. And I pray this every day. Lord, make me creative. And I'm just a regular guy. And I know you think, oh, you must be super smart. I'm just a regular guy. I had regular SAT grades. I had, I had, uh, uh, I, I was lucky to get into Syracuse University. I never could have gotten into Rice University as a student. Just a regular guy. And what I'm here to testify is what God can do for regular people if you learn to seek Him and trust His word. <clears throat> Attaining peace. Philippians 4 9. The things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, it's Paul speaking. You practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Peace comes through practice. You practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Peace comes through practice. If you practice what I've told you today, the God of peace will be with you. And I've never known anybody to say, well, I, as I wake up in the morning, I hope this is a miserable day. <laughs> really just no peace at all. Well, everybody wants peace. How do you get it? The God of peace will be with you when you practice these things. I want to close in telling you the story of how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. How did I come to faith? I was born... I'm Jewish. I was born a Jew, raised a Jew in New York City, just outside New York City, 
which is north of the city, in a, in a secular Jewish home. And I went to college, and I was in the laundry room August of my freshman year. And I met a young man in the laundry room, and I said he was on the Syracuse University football team. And we got to talking, and, and this was the first load of laundry I'd done. And my mother did the laundry for me my whole life. This was the first load of laundry I ever did. And I was 18 years old. I just turned 18. I remember. And uh, we're doing laundry, and I, I said, do you want to play pro ball when you graduate? So I'm not, I'm not good enough for that. So what do you want to do? He says, oh, let me ministry. I said, I don't know what lay ministry is. He said, sort of like a missionary. It's a missionary. There's no missionaries today. Missionary, we got, we got TV. This is 1977. <laughs> Even in there, why do you need missionaries? <clears throat> he said, I'd like to give you <clears throat> he said, I'd like to give you an illustration of the gospel. I said, okay. <clears throat> so he drew me this picture. And, and this was before <clears throat> before computers, before computers. <laughs> well, we we had computers. We didn't have we didn't have computers like this. I just used a PDP eleven in, in high school. <clears throat> you don't know what that is, but the ticker tape, it's a tape that holds it. How's your program? You come in and you feed in that tape. Your program would load. Use the old IBM code also. Remember to use the old IBM code. You left left all vowels out. Just to save bits. You load all your words without vowels because you kind of figure it out oh without the vowels. But you were just saving bits because bits were expensive. But anyway, um, put people on one side, God on the other, and he said, Sin separates us from God. He had me read this verse, for all of sin falls short of the glory of God. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Because as a modern, secular Jew, in my Jewish home, we never talk about sin. I never remember mentioning the word of sin, the, the word of sin ever in my life, in my home. And for us, it, it was, it, you know, right or wrong, you'd go to the, to the synagogue once a year, and the rabbi would say some things, and I'd right, walk out feeling, okay, I'm, I'm forgiven now. And uh, um, I... I I never felt that I sinned. I thought you had to kill somebody. I said, yeah, I never killed anybody. I never robbed a bank. I could never be a sinner. Then you have to read this verse. But I say to you here, that, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I was just hit. Because I was addicted to pornography from the age of 14. I started working at a gas station just outside New York City on the highway. And the, the, the salesman would throw away their magazines on Friday nights on their way home from their sales meeting. And I was cleaning the, the parking lots. That was my job. I was 14. I told the guy I was 16. They didn't check any paperwork in those days. I'm not sure they could check paperwork in these days, but they certainly didn't check it in those days. And, and I, I became addicted to pornography. And I didn't think anybody knew. And this man from 2,000 years ago was calling me out. I read this and I was reading it. This is the first time I realized that I'm a sinner. And of all verses in the Bible for this young man, he and I. And that was the one that got me. That's the day that I recognized I was a sinner. <clears throat> for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of yours, so that no one may boast. Now remember he drew this little arrow. He said, your good works aren't necessarily bad, but they'll never get you to God because you're a sinner and imperfect. God is perfect. For by grace you have been saved. He said, grace is an undeserved gift. It's an undeserved gift. <coughs> and you're going to receive this thing through faith. Unlike other gifts where you hold out your hand and you take it, this is a gift that you receive by believing. By faith. And it is a gift. And no works that you can do this common feeling among lots of people, well, I'm a pretty good guy. My good works outweigh my bad works. I'll kind of be okay. The Bible says no. It won't, it won't work that way. The Bible's very clear. It won't work that way. Your good works won't do it. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you have to open up the scriptures and then read this. He's, remember, he said, this wages of sin being death, this is death is eternal separation from God. But he said, there's a free gift. There it again is again. It's a gift. It's a free gift. 
and is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his own love toward us. He demonstrated it. <clears throat> that while we were yet sinners, in the state that I'm in, if you feel yourself righteous, I have nothing for you. Jesus did not come to die for the righteous, but it says he died for the unrighteous. The Bible clearly says Jesus died for the ungodly. If you're godly, you go get your salvation somewhere else. It's not in Jesus. Jesus died for the ungodly. And I thought, this is for me. This works for me. <clears throat> because I'm of the ungodly. This works for me. In the state in which I'm in. And he demonstrated his love. He gave his son to die in my place. And one day, you're going to be a parent. And you're going to realize you would give your life 100 times for your child if you could. You would love that child so much more than you love yourself. And God took his child, his son, and gave him on my behalf. This is the ultimate picture of love. That I give the one who I love the very most, my own son, but to give him for you. And that bridges the way. I remember he drew this cross. Then he had me read this verse. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See that? There's that word will again. You will be saved. How do I get saved? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And this is an amazing thing. That Jesus rose physically from the grave. Jesus rose physically from the grave. How do we know? There's more written about the physical resurrection, more historical accounts of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other event from that era. Hands down. He was seen by over 500 people at one time. Hallucinations are not shared. It wasn't just on a misty night that they saw some figure go by. No. He ate with them. He sat with them. He talked with them. He said, come, feel me, touch my hands, touch my arms. You see, I have flesh and bones. He ate in front of them. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it until I stick my finger in the holes in his hands and my hand into the hole in his side. Jesus appears to him. He walks in the road and he says, peace be to you. Thomas, come here. Put your finger in the hole in my hand. Thomas sticks his finger in the hole in his hand. He says, now you stick your hand into the hole in my side. And be not unbelieving and believing. Jesus had all the wounds from the crucifixion. So we know it was not an imposter. Clear, Jesus rose physically from the dead. It is a physical resurrection. He rose from the dead. How can God make this a requirement that he is causing, he says, believe in your heart. That's a sincere belief that God raised him from the dead. How does any thinking man or woman believe that? That will get you to God. He shared with me on, in August of 1977, and now it's November 7, 1977. I was in that room at Syracuse University. That was my dormitory room. In 1812. And I was all alone in my room. The roommate wasn't there. And I got on my knees. And I said, Lord, forgive me, because I am a sinner. This burden of sin that I was carrying from knowing that I was just engrossed in pornography. And I couldn't look at a woman without thinking lustful thoughts. It was just, and I asked God to forgive me. And I felt this immediate sense of forgiveness showering in upon me. And then all of a sudden, somebody was standing in my room. And I was shocked. And I looked. And I couldn't see anything, but somebody was standing right there. And then this love just being poured out. I just started weeping like a baby. I have a problem. I don't, I don't weep easily. I, I, a friend will die, and I don't even cry. I don't listen to God's will. I mean, and, and it, you know, something's wrong with me. But that day, I was just crying and crying. <coughs> because the love that was being poured out, there was no judgment. I wasn't afraid of his presence. He was just kind and just pouring out love. Finally, I composed myself. I didn't tell anybody. Here's this Jewish kid from New York City. What am I going to say? I don't even know what to say. 
And, and uh, I remember walking out on the floor after a couple weeks. The guy said to me, the guy who had shared with me in August, he lived on my floor, he said, Jim, have you accepted Jesus in your heart? I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. <laughs> Something happened to me on that day. I said, how can I, I asked him, how can I keep this sense of closeness to God? He said, I've talked to people who drift away from the Lord, and I asked them, were you reading your Bible every day? They said, no. And I've talked to people who always remain close to the Lord, vibrant relationship. He says, I asked them, do you read your Bible every day? They say, yes. And I said, that I can do. I can read my Bible every day. For over 40, for over 40 years, I've read my Bible every day. And, uh, um, and I've read this over and over again. This is the last slide. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God comes to you today, and he says, I'm going to wipe out your transgressions, and I will not remember your sins. God chooses not to remember them, which means he's not going to act upon it. And he says, I'm the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. What does that mean, for my own sake? I liken it to this. If one of my sons went to jail, I would go right away and bail out my son. And even if my son said, Dad, no, I deserve to be here, I would say, maybe so, but you're my son, I'm bailing you out. We'll deal with that later, I'm bailing you out. For my own sake, you're coming out of jail. God says, for my own sake, I'm coming to you. Some people think they're not worthy of such a forgiveness. And so God says, for my own sake, I'm doing it. Because I love you so much, for my own sake. I beg you today, I beg you, come to Jesus today. If you do not know him, the word of the cross is come. Come to me. Jesus says, come to me. I urge you today, come to him. I beg you today, come to him. I don't want to see you go from this place without knowing Jesus. This Lord whom I love so much, so much. I want you to have the same experience. I want you to have the joy in your marriage that I have. I want you to have the joy with your children that I have. I want you to have the joy in your career that I have. I want you to have the, the joy in your relationship with God that I have. I want you to be able to pick up the scriptures and just feed on this like it's your food, your life, like I have. Come to Jesus this day. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It would be unfair of God to expect an educated person to believe in the physical resurrection unless he made it entirely possible. I speak with almost only educated people. The, the, it's rare that I speak with an uneducated person just because I work in an academic environment. And I see generally at least one person a week coming to the Lord, anywhere between one and five a week. And these are all educated people. They're either undergraduates at Rice, <coughs> or graduate students, or postdocs, or professors, or physicians from across the street, medical school from across the street, or from, from in the medical, Texas Medical Center. And I'm always amazed because I see educated people go from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection over a 10 minute conversation. And the only way that I can explain that is this. That God has placed the truth of the resurrection on your heart already. It would be unfair of him to call us in, to believe something so incredible as a physical resurrection, something that we've never seen nor anybody we've ever known has seen. Unless he's already placed that truth on your heart. He didn't make this easy. He didn't say, just believe that Jesus loved the little children. No. you got to believe that he rose physically from the dead. I am going to pray. As I pray, I want you to pray with me. Pray with me. Inviting Jesus into your life. I urge you, do not go from this place. Don't say, i got to go home and think about it. You don't have to go home and think about this. Psalm 119, verse 60 says, I made haste and I did not delay to keep your commandments. What is the commandment of God? <coughs> Make haste to do it. God commands us. 1 John 3, 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, 
This is his commandment to you. Do it now. Don't go from this place. And then, if this is the day, the first time that you're going to be praying this, I want you to come up and talk to me afterward. You've got to talk to me afterward. Because I want to know it. Because I want to rejoice with you. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Wash me clean. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. For dying for me. I believe that you are Lord. I believe that you are Lord. And I believe Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. I believe Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. draw them close and they would honor what your word says by meditating on it daily. And Lord, for those here that know you, but have neglected to do as your word commands us, to daily meditate on the word of God, I pray, Lord, that from this day, they would not put their head down and go to sleep tonight without reading the scriptures and meditating on it. And that they would rise up early and meditate on the word of God and make it their daily practice. And so, Father, I know that you will fulfill your word and you will give them peace and you will give them blessing and you will give them prosperity as only you can do. Lord Jesus, draw these people to your son, I pray. In Jesus' name. lunacy if you think that everything in a few hundred years is going to be explained by science because if you know anything about science every stone you unturn you, you turn over and you, you, you find your solution you get five more questions so there's only going to be many more things that we don't know in several hundred years but I agree with you if you had asked a man in 1850 where is the information stored in a cell they'd have gone like huh must be God no but now we know the information is stored in the DNA 
And so that's our blueprint there. So there's many things we don't know that later on we know. Well, bib, what? So what? So there's going to be many things we, we don't know now, and we're going to know that later. So what does that mean? It's it just, and, and then it, when I study science, I see something new, and, and, and then I say, wow, God, that's how you did it. It's amazing. And there is a naturalistic explanation for this. God did it this way. He stored information in the cell. And if you really know a lot about cells, you'll understand this is a ton more information than you, that you can store in carbohydrates than you can in DNA. A ton more. And, and uh, so, so there's, there's even more information storage systems than you might imagine. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the next question. The talk started with social psychology and then a brief discussion about morals. Can't people develop conscience to figure things out by themselves? I'm not an accomplished person like Dr. Tour or a believer, but I have my own morals which I developed from my own conscience. I know everyone's perspective is different, but why does everything have to be explained through God? Well, I'm not so sure that you develop that through your own conscience. I really, I really, really don't think so. I mean, there, there are ethics that you've gotten from the society in which you've lived, which has been a Judeo-Christian society, that, that have influenced you far more than your own conscience might, might, might imagine. So we have all been greatly influenced by this Judeo-Christian ethic. When you look at societies that don't have this, you see the, way, the treatment of children, you see the treatment of women, and you see the treatment of, of your fellow person as being much, much different than probably the way you would have developed. And so, so I think we have so much to be thankful for, for the scriptures. Now, whether you embrace the scriptures as the very word of God, every word in the scriptures is the spoken word of God, as I do, is another issue. But the things that have been written in the scriptures have influenced you. Because if you are if you are here in Tulsa, Oklahoma today, you've been deeply influenced by this. And I'm not saying that you have to do anything. You, you do whatever you want. I am presenting to you my life. I'm presenting to you my life. And you take it as, as you want to take it. I'm, I'm not trying to force anything upon anybody, nor am I Robbie Zacharias, that I can give some great, eloquent, <laughs> apologetics argument for all of this. I just love Jesus. If you have a question about science, I'll do my best to do it, if, you, if it's about chemistry. If it's about other sciences, I'll, I'll let somebody else answer it. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment before reading the next question. And it's just my observation as somebody who's been watching this for some time. Maybe you'll have a comment on it. But um, I find that there are a number of uh, really top shelf scientists who are also ardent believers. Um, I've got books on my shelves, one that comes to mind, Real Scientists, Real Faith. And it really speaks of uh, top shelf scientists who do have a faith in Christ. And I found kind of an interesting theme, and that was none of them fought their way to God. None of them <coughs> sat down and really uh, intellectually came to a relationship with God. But like yourself, each, almost every one of them had a, an experience that... Uh, that <coughs> really changed their lives. Do you have a comment about that? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, some people think, oh, well, you know, you really, so, so all your studies drew you to God. No, I mean, I was hit with, I'm a sinner. And I knew I was a sinner. And and I prayed, and, and the presence of God came, came upon, it, it came into my room, and it just hit me, and the scriptures had fed my life. This was not a deep intellectual pursuit. I'm not saying that that can't happen. But I'm saying it's rare. It's rare. I know even Rick Smalley, Rick Smalley, Nobel Prize winner, sharing with him, and uh, uh, something hit him in the heart. Something hit him, and th people think, oh, it must have been a great intellectual thing. He was a Nobel Prize winner. No, I saw it with my own eyes. The Holy Spirit comes and he impresses himself upon the heart. The truth of the resurrection is already there. And, and uh, um, so I would. I mean, most of my experience, it's not been an intellectual thing. 
I've heard experiences where it is, but that wasn't it that way for me. This question. Science isn't faith-based. It's fact-based. Nothing is true until proven and could be replicated by others to get the same results. That's how science research works. Faith isn't measurable. Because of faith, a person's perspective could be entirely influenced. What's Dr. Tour's perspective on this? I wouldn't say that he couldn't be more wrong, but he'd be hard. Um, science, there's so little in science that we can explain well. <clears throat> okay, smart person, tell me the origin of life. You've got to make four classes of compounds. You've got to make your amino acids, which are going to build all your proteins. You've got to make your carbohydrates. You've got, you've got to make your nucleic acids, which can form your DNA, RNA, and your lipids. We have no idea how any one of those classes could have been made on an early Earth. No idea, and especially in chiral form. None. None. If you have those four classes, now you've got to hook them up. <clears throat> how do you hook up amino acids? How do you do this cleanly? No idea on an early Earth. How do you... How do you now assemble a cell? Even if I gave you all the components now assemble a cell, where are you going to get the code for the DNA? Remember, just hooking up nucleic acids is hard to do. Look at the DNA synthesizer, all the different blood. We have no idea where, where life started, how it came about. Where's the science in that? Where's the fact? Fact, fact. Where's the fact? Describe to me energy. What is energy? Very hard to describe even what is energy. How do you have evolution of a complex system? How does one complex system change into another? And all you get from biologists is storytelling. <laughs> nothing has been shown, nothing has been shown in evolution of a complex system, nor is there even a valid proposal other than some waving of hands of storytelling. There is so much in science that is based on faith. So much! That's why I say it would be hard to be more wrong than what you're suggesting. Now, as far as based on faith, the scripture, there are eyewitness accounts. There are eyewitness accounts to things. We put people in the electric chair. We, put, we, we, we inject them with chemicals that kill them based on eyewitness accounts. That's how you prove things in a court of law. There's something which, call, which is called a historical proof. People see things and they record it. That is a proof upon which you build things. There's many things you cannot put under a microscope. Many things. And this is fact-based proof. This is facts where people are, are recording this. So, so, you're wrong. So, yes, there are professional lines. So, for example, if I have a student in my laboratory that works for me under my charge, meaning that I control their PhD, they are less likely to get the gospel shared with them than a student that doesn't work for me. Because I don't want them to feel pressure that now I control their grade and they're, and they're out. So unless they start showing signs that they're interested in this, once they show signs of their mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, because of that, but I'm, I'm careful about that when they're under my charge. Because I don't want them to feel that unnecessary pressure. So there are professional lines. I'm not going to stand up in my classroom in a secular university and say, the code for this DNA came from God. Because I don't know that. I know ultimately that's the case, but in a hundred years we may understand where how that code was developed. You know, so, so there's many things I don't understand, so I don't get up in the classroom and it's in it. But I do, I do put a scripture verse on the top of every one of my exams. I've done that for 32 years. Every one of my exams. And so, so um, and what I've learned is that, it, and it's usually, you know, it's a generic thing. It's something really nice about love or something. 
And, and <laughs> students write back to me scripture verses. The most common one on the exam being, blessed are the merciful. <laughs> 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 So, so, yeah, I, I do express it in that way. I have gotten blowback sometimes. One day, some students, you know, organic chemistry, not everybody does well. And, and, uh, <laughs> so, before the internet came in, where I could put up a, a statement about myself, if you go to my internet site, jmtour.com, you go to the personal topics section. Now, when you click on personal topics, you're going to get personal topics. I mean, you clicked on it. And, and so, you go there at your own risk. And so you click on that, you can see about my thing, and and uh, and that's my professional website. And but you clicked on personal topics, so you got it. But I used to hand out at the end of each semester, I would I would write out a little little uh, testimony about how much I love Jesus and things like this, and it would say right at the top, copied at Kinko's by personal expense, and I would leave it up at the front of the room and say, after you finish your exam, I have a gift for you. It's optional, and it would say right on it, optional, and say you can have this if you want it on your way out. Option. Well, anyways, a couple of students did really poorly in my class. They brought it to the to the uh, provost's office, and they said, "You know, this guy's preaching religion." And so the provost contacted the dean because he didn't want to have to deal with me. And the dean <laughs> called me in his office. He was a friend of mine, and he and his name was was Jerry. My third name. And he says, "Jerry says, uh, Jim, uh, uh, the university council that means the lawyer that you are has assessed that you may have violated the law here." I said, "Jerry, I assure you, I haven't violated." The some people put up, you know, they say, here's, you, you, you can play tennis with me, you know, after the semester if you want to. If you can put that, you can put it instead of check on the law, there's no problem. And I said, plus, I put a scripture verse at the top of every exam, too. And uh, and, and I said, so, so then, he, he, he didn't say anything, and we, we, we parted. It, it, what he did say is, Jim, look, let me just tell you, I believe you. I'm just like you. I believe, ultimately, God has done all of this. Hmm. I said, isn't it odd that you, the dean, and me, the professor of chemistry, we can agree with this in your office, but we can't say it out there. You know, it might really infect them. Hmm. And, and so the next exam that I gave, I put on there, not just a scripture verse, I put on the prayer of George Washington over this country. Hmm. He talks about the blessed son of Jesus Christ. I mean, really explicit. <laughs> and then I sent a copy of it to the dean and the provost. And, I said, and it said by right another, George Washington. And I said, would the university like to tell me which parts of the father of our country, George Washington, I, I can quote, and which parts I'm not allowed to quote? <laughs> And then the university council said, I don't think you broke the law. <laughs> I've got a couple more here, and then uh, we'll uh, give Dr. Tour a rest. Reason is the preamble to faith. Could you explain as an intellectual how you came to justify your faith. You know, I, I tell you, when Jesus walked in my room, and I experienced this with God, I can't explain that. But since then, I have studied the resurrection. I've studied historical accounts of the resurrection. I've studied the writings of the resurrection. And they are just so tight. I have... If you went to YouTube and you just did James Tour Resurrection, you would see a YouTube video that I did on the resurrection, just looking at the scriptures themselves and the veracity of the claims and how it matches up, how it should perfectly be. The, 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 the synchrony between the four gospel accounts of the resurrection. And so there is a lot of reason in this. I came to the Lord because of a personal experience. It wasn't a rational thing where I was working through equations and I was working through documents and, you know, leaving them alone. Look at that document. Yes, it must be. You look at the structure of DNA, it does not say, Jesus Christ was here. I didn't have that. It was a personal experience. Since then, I have studied this and looked at it, and my faith has grown more and more and more because of the evidence that is there. This is an evidence-based faith. Christianity invites you to examine this. 
It invites you to examine the resurrection. Examine it. There are no curses around this. If you investigate the resurrection, your firstborn child will die. Your wife will go blind. There's none of that. Investigate it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, this person saw me, and then this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Investigate it. Ask them. He says, ask them. Most of them are around alive today, Paul was telling the Corinthians. Ask them. This is unlike any other faith. There's no taboos. He says, investigate. It is clear. They welcome investigation. This is a wide open study. Wide open. And this is why any academic, any academic scholar in any department of religion anywhere in the United States, whether they be Hindu, Muslim, any academic scholar, will indeed confess that the disciples of Jesus sincerely believed him to have risen from the dead. They read, you can read his writings and you can see, you can read the writings and see that they sincerely believed him to have risen from the dead, and that's why they died for this. It's very different. I believe Jesus Christ to have risen from the dead. I never saw him in the flesh rising from the dead. I am willing to die for my faith, for what I believe. But the first century apostles did not die for something they believed to be true. They died for something they knew to be true. They knew the resurrection to be true. So, so for example, two of them were flayed alive. That means they were tied down to the ground and the skin is peeled off. You'd think if, if they knew this to be a lie, they would say, hey, psych. <laughs> you know, we took his body, I'll tell you where it is. Another one was boiled in oil. Another one was crucified upside down. These were gruesome deaths. They died for something they knew to be true. Nobody dies for something they know to be a lie. They never would have set the resurrection at so high a barrier. This is what you have to do to be saved. This is what it says. You have to do this to be saved. If they were just trying to build a new religion, they would say, all you have to do is believe Jesus was nice to children. Well, I can't believe that. <laughs> no. you got to believe in your heart. That means in your heart, the very depth within you, that he's risen from the dead. That's how strongly they knew this to be true. I don't even know if I answered that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm touched by this question. My son has tuberous sclerosis, which affects the way he talks and learns. Is it possible that the same type of process that helped the lab rat in the video could help the TS brain form healthy connections to abrogate the damage caused by tuberous sclerosis? Well, I would sure hope so. First of all, let me just say, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. I'm a father of four children. And any parent <clears throat> looks upon their children and says, I would much rather bear that disease, that pain, that hardship myself than to see you, my child, go through this. So I'm very sorry for what you're having to go through. What we are developing <clears throat> now is many years away from the clinic. The normal time from the laboratory to the clinic, normal average time is 14 years. And so it takes a long time to get to the clinic. So I don't have an answer for you right away. I would have to study that more to see if, there, if, if, if this could work. We have thought about using the graphene nano ribbons to stimulate connections within the brain. We have thought about that. We've never <coughs> tried it. We've done, only done on spinal cords, peripheral nerves, and optic nerves. And we're actually seeing optic nerves refiring. And if we can get that to work, we can really do a whole lot of transplants. I mean, it's never been done. I'd have to study that disease. I don't know anything about it. Um, and may God help me. And that, that, that's all I can give. Very good questions keep coming in. Dr. Turr, starting at November 7th, Um, I informed them shortly after that. I didn't keep it a secret. I informed my mother and my father and, and, and my cousins. And my, I informed everybody. I mean, you, you'd say this in the Jewish family. All you got to do is tell what. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, 
you know, they weren't praising the Lord, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but but um, I remember my mother came to the church, and, and uh, uh, I was in, it was in a church, it was by an Indian church, not Indian like Indians, like around here Indians. These are Asian Indian church. And, and, uh, and uh, we all got down on our knees during the worship service and praying and giving our thanks. And my mother was sitting there and just weeping, weeping, weeping. And after the service, I said, you were really touched in the service. She says, what makes you think I was touched? I said, because you were weeping. She says, I'm weeping because my son is here. <laughs> I said, well, where would you like to be on a Sunday? She said, how about the beach like any other normal human being? And, you know, this is a Jewish mother. She's just going to be sincere when she feels. She felt that I'd be better off at the beach. But I asked her to read the New Testament. And she, she is a very careful reader, and she read the entire New Testament, something most Christians have not even done. And I said, what do you think of that? She said, I don't blame him for killing Jesus for the things that he said. Who is that man in his 30s to have come against these religious leaders like that who have dedicated their lives to helping people? What does he expect? Of course they're going to kill him. And did you know that that's probably the response you should have? If you do not see him as the Son of God, who is he to do this? Mm -hmm. And then I said, why don't you read the Old Testament, something that most Jews have never done. And she read the entire Old Testament slowly, carefully, and she got down and said, look, she said, God warned us over and over again, he warned us. And then years later, she started reading it again. And her second time through reading the New Testament, she called me one day, and she said, Jimmy, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened, Mom? She said, I was just reading about the crucifixion. I was reading about it. And it hit me. It hit me. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just like that. The age of 72, my mother gave me that. And then the next week she called me. She said, Jimmy, you can find any damn thing in the Bible. <laughs> I said, what has you found, Mom? She said, it says husbands should love the wife of their youth. I said, yeah, it says that. I said, I said uh, you should tell Dad. <laughs> she says, I told your father what it says. And I heard my father say, I know all that already. <laughs> That's a great question. That is a great question. I mean, look, Jesus Christ came into my room and he befriended me. He befriended me. And that's why I came. A Jewish guy, I came. I believe he rose from the dead, he forgave me, he befriended me, and he fed my spirit over and over again. But then if you look at the analysis of the scriptures, the scriptures are so deep. Exactly what I told you. It invites investigation. And you see over and over again the history, the archaeology that matches up with this over and over again. You say, well, there's not enough archaeology that the Jews uh, crossed through the Red Sea. Okay, well, give it time. I mean, you're the one to tell me that I should wait for science to come up with this. Okay, wait for the archaeology to be found to give enough evidence for that so you get for evidence for that too, but there's so much archaeology around this, so much surrounding evidence. When you look at the writings of Josephus, who wasn't very friendly to first century Jewish believers at all, and uh, and you look at the, the, the things around this, there's so much going for this, so much scholarship around this, and you can come at this at every angle you want, and nobody threatens you and says, hey, if you speak something bad about that, we're going to you know, come against you and kill you and your family. We're not, no. It says, go ahead. We invite you to investigate this. It's like no other faith, the authenticity as, uh, as to what's around us. But I'm going to close with this verse. John chapter, John chapter 7, verse 17 says, Jesus said, 
they would, they would question and say, how do we really know you're from God? How do we know? And Jesus said this, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Jesus said, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He, we are told to believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, that truth is already there in your heart. You don't have to believe in the virgin birth. You don't have to believe in Adam and Eve. You don't have to believe in the, in the, in the crossing of the Red Sea. You don't have to believe any of that to be saved. To be saved, it's that and that only. But when you start obeying him, and you start seeing that, wow, I obeyed and exactly this happened. I obeyed exactly this happened. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is God or whether I speak for myself. You obey the word of God, and you become a truster in it. You trust it. I tell my students all the time, I am not a prophet. This is the students who attend my Bible study. I am not a prophet. I'm not. But I can look at a student's life and I know what their future holds. Because I have so many data points. When students do this and this and this in life, this is how their marriages end up. When students do this, this is how their lives end up. When students obey the word of God, this is how their lives turn out. You obey the word of God and you will see that it is true over and over again. When you're willing to do his will, then you will know of the teaching whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself.